Okay, and I give you a really great example. I had this one couple that came in that they, they had three kids that were eight, five, and four, right? And the kids were running the household. They were splitting the parents because the dad came from a family of Marines. Both his parents were drill sergeants, even the mom, right? Okay, boot camp kind of guy. He was a Marine. And um, the mom grew up in a commune with tofu eating hippies and all the way up. The dad was like this bright wing like conservative Republican, right? And the mom was this like hippy dippy. I mean, she wore love beads and she like, ate tofu and you know, she had dreadlocks. And, and I said, how did the, t the t sex must have been great. That's all I can think of. That's the only reason you two got together, right? And they were like, yeah, it was awesome, man. And I said, but then they, <laughs> they got together and they were like this, right? Bumping heads on everything because their beliefs were so different on so many things. And his philosophy was this. I'm the alpha dog, and that the alpha dog occasionally has to whoop the pup's ass, okay? Bite them on the neck, beat them down to remind them who the alpha dog is so that they don't act up and challenge the authority. I'm the pack leader, all right? And the mom was like, well, if we just teach them how to meditate and how to do this and whatever, she's really like, like hands off and just lazy, like let the kids do whatever they want to do. Well, guess who was running the house? the kids, right? Because they could split mom and dad and they get mom and dad fighting with each other and they go, yay, we get to go do what we want to do. And so I said, if you stay stuck in your position, is anything going to happen? No. Nothing's going to happen, right? So I said, you got to start identifying what your common interests are here. What do you really want for your kids? And they said, well, we want them to be respectful, follow the rules, learn responsibility, learn how to earn privileges, you know, understand discipline and all the other kind of things like that. And I said, okay. So they both could agree that they had some common interests, right? I th and then you go into brainstorming options. That's the O. So I said, do you know any other parenting techniques besides either beat the hell out of them or let them do whatever the hell they want? And they go, oh, uh, no. And the kids were at this perfect age for this one parenting technique called one, two, three magic, okay? And there's a book and a DVD that I had and they could watch it and they could learn this skill, right? So both parents had to be on the same page. And what it did was it, had, it taught parents how to get kids to stop behaviors they didn't want them doing, but also it had starting behaviors. Because like, one of the hardest things is getting your kids out of the house sometimes, making sure that you know, get them everything you want them to get started to go do things too. And so it takes about a month to learn the technique. And then another month when you put it into place after you tell the kids, we're going to put this in place and they test you for a month at least to go, well, we'll see if you're serious about changing. Because we liked being in charge. We don't want you to, you're changing the rules and we don't like that. So they test it for a month. And then, you know, it's, it takes about another month after that for things to finally start settling down. So that's what we did. So that you, you use objective criteria to pick a solution because if it's just my idea, you have to say you're wrong, you know? And that's why you can't like solve a conflict out in public either, right? You can't embarrass people, you can't shame them. People won't be involved with that, okay? So they tried it. And we agreed that they would like come back, they would like practice it in my office for a month. So they came back once a week. And then for the next month, they were gonna come back every other week while they were putting it in place. But they came back every week because they go, this shit's hard, Chris. Oh my God, the kids are driving us nuts. You are right, they are pushing every boundary. And then the next month, it finally started to calm down. And so you pick a time frame. that's the E, okay? You pick a time frame to evaluate the results. And they came back and the dad said, you know, I really hate to admit it, but the kids actually, I think, respect us more and they're not afraid of us. And my kids actually aren't, af they actually like are happy to see me when I come home now. Before they were always like, because the mom used to say, well, I'll let your dad take care of it when he gets home. And he goes, it's terrible to come home, Chris, and always be the bad guy. You know, who wants to come home and always be the heavy? And I was getting resentful at my wife because I was like, how come I'm the only one doing the discipline? And you get to play with them all the time and have all this fun, and I got to come home and be the heavy all the time. So now they felt like a team, right? I said, so, so that the results worked for you. And they said, yeah. And it was funny because I saw them a few months ago in Myers, and um, they just started putting this into place like last year, right? And they said, she said, Chris, you know what? This worked. We were having a, some issues about um, our money was really tight right now. And before, I just wouldn't talk about money because I was just like, oh, and then I get mad when he would just spend it, you know, or do whatever. So we sat down and we applied this to our money situation, and it works. 
we have, we're like much more equipped now to work through conflict. Whereas before I would just go, whatever, and just run away. And he'd be like, where are you? You're supposed to be my partner. Okay? And she goes, I learned that conflict doesn't mean that I'm going to, you know, necessarily not get heard or get hurt or not get my needs met. Okay? All right. So that's conflict resolution. You can't do it when you're upset. Okay, active listening is the same way down here. Okay, I remember we said like, what do you need? Do you need to listen a solution or do you need me to help you, you know, do you need some space? If people say listen, active listening is just that. Active listening is not waiting for the other person to stop. It's not like, are you done? Are you done? Are you done? Okay, are you done talking? Now listen to what I want to say, okay? I had a really great therapist said, you know, Chris, this is what adults do in relationship. If they don't feel like they're getting heard, who in a relationship, whoever is the first person to recognize that, that you're not getting heard, you can bet the other person's not feeling heard either. So this is what adults do. Adults say, let me take me out of the picture for a second, because I have to be willing to give what I want to get. So you say, you know what, I don't feel like I'm being heard, but if I'm not, I bet you're not either. Let me take me out of the way. What are you feeling right now? What do you need me to hear? What do you need from me? And I said, what if I'm right? <laughs> I did not like hearing that, right? And she goes, you can be right and alone, Chris, and divorced. You can be right and alone because nobody wants to live with a dictator. Nobody. Okay. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know? And that's hard. That's really hard, especially when you feel like you're right or you feel this or whatever. And you know, we had to give each other permission not to talk to each other when we're really mad. I need space. But we trust each other that we're going to go calm down, use all of our tools to calm down, mm -hmm. not go act out, not do whatever, right? And then come back and use the skills that we've learned over time. And we trust each other that we're going to do it after 23 years, hopefully, right? So it's like, but it's still hard, especially when wounds get hit or you're tired or you're upset or you're afraid or something like that. This is really hard. This is the grown-up stuff, though. This is what grown-ups do, you know? And I met a lot of older people in relationships in life, but not a lot of grown-ups. <laughs> okay. And grown-ups, like, give what they want to get. And addiction doesn't think like that, right? Addiction waits for the joint to come around. Don't take that last hit. I never saw anybody share their last rock at the crack house. <laughs> Ever. Right? Wrong. Like, so. All right. And then there's some rules on here about fair and unfair fighting that talk about how to, like, do it better. You know, there's some skills and everything that you can have on here. All right. But the most important thing to remember is that this is, these are skills that have to be practiced over time. The other person has to be on the same page with you. Okay. And you can't just drop this on them if they've never done it before and say, hey, I want to try effective conflict resolution when they're upset. Screw you, effective conflict resolution. You know, uh, what do you mean? You're changing the rules on me again and whatever. You have to talk about these things when you're calm. So you have to get out of that mindset about, is this about being right or being effective? And all I know is that if a person always has to be right, they're not so right in the head. Okay? There's a test they give you in graduate school to determine if somebody's psychotic or crazy. Okay? And this is the test. If, that it's, if somebody said, like if Ray looked at me and said, hey, Chris, that TV's talking to me right now when it's not turned on. And I go, Ray, is there any possibility that could not be true? And he goes, no, I'm telling you I'm right. That thing is on. And it's telling me to like do things and do whatever. I look at Ray and I go, oh, Ray, we need some medication and we need to get you hospitalized, <laughs> okay? Because you are crazy. You are psychotic. You are not in your right head at that moment, okay? Lots of people make things get stuck in being right. One can be a wound getting hit, fear, you know, pain. A lot of things get people to that place of having to stay entrenched because your beliefs in life are your truth. Okay, I heard once that your beliefs die an hour after you do. Because they're your truth in life and they help you feel safe and maintain an illusion of control. 
okay? People go to war. People flee those buildings. You know, I was a priest. I'm not going to fly a building into a plane to try to get you to take communion, okay, or come to confession <laughs> because you all aren't being Catholic today, okay? Those guys who flew the planes into the World Trade Center, what did they believe? That they were going where? And they were going to get what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were going to like, oh, get praised. And you know what? And their belief was backed up by the fact that, you know, people who are suicide bombers in the Middle East, in the, in the cities that they, they're from, they, their families get money, they get praise, they get support. There's a lot of positive things that they get that reinforce that belief, okay? People will die for their beliefs. And sometimes you have to decide, am I up against a belief that just won't change? You just may not be a good fit to be with that person then. And that's when you have to grieve the loss of what you wanted that relationship to be. But that's your job then. They don't want to change. Like I said, you could get better, right? It can also be this. They have to look at themselves and grow with you and support you and work their own program of recovery, their own healing program. They can split, or the only other choice they have if they stay with you is to do what? knock you down if they're not healthy. That is the only other choice they have if they're not working, taking responsibility for themselves. And you'll know that because no matter what you do, it's not enough. That's how you'll know you're with a person like this and they're doing no work on themselves. And the only thing you ever have to do with that is just not lower your, you know, my grandmother used to tell me, she was the therapist, she said, Chris, you've got to stop lowering your tolerance level. You've got to keep it high. No, that's not right. And she said, if you're willing to bring it, you can demand it. Right? So I keep my agreements in relationships. I don't break them without negotiating them first. That's part of my redefining myself as the person in recovery. It's what the steps help us do, right? Okay? That's the work of us in recovery. It's not about just not drinking and using anymore. It's about changing the way that we approach life as well. And these are the skills, the recovery skills, that we have to start getting and working if we're going to do it better when we get out there. Or every time we face conflict, eventually we'll get overwhelmed enough where we look in our bag and we go, God, I got drinking and using, going crazy or killing myself. What's the healthiest choice then? <coughs> What's that? Uh, <laughs> killing the other person. No, that's not the healthiest choice. No, no. Drinking and using. Because at least you get something from it, right? Yeah. Oh, you get something, you get immediate gratification at least. I'm thinking of my ex wife. It's all the time. gratification by eliminating the problem. Yeah, but then you, what do you give up? Yeah, I know I'm going to go to jail if I kill somebody, probably, okay? But with drinking and using it, it's always a crapshoot how bad it could be. Because, you know, what did they say in AA? We'll be here not if you make it, not when you make it back, but if you make it back with relapse. They'll say, we'll be here if you make it back. Because accidents happen, right? They do. Yeah. And people, get, people can be crazy under the influence. Too. Yeah, yeah. Or you could kill somebody else, who knows? You know? I just went and saw a guy over in the... Um, jail that I used to work with that's there up in um, Whitley County and he killed a family of four. Blackout. Doesn't even remember it. Does not even remember it. He just woke up and said, oh God, got to go in front of the judge again. And the, the, the guard looked at him and said, dude. Uh, he says, what's my bail going to be set at, do you think? He goes, dude, you're not getting bail. <laughs> he goes, what do you mean? And he was like, then they told him and he couldn't believe it. He didn't believe it until they showed him the videotape. On the videotape of him at the crime scene, he was, this is how drunk and what a blackout he was. He thought he was in a movie. He thought it was a movie set. And he was sitting there going, look, look, these people look like they're, that, that's really good makeup, man. They look like they're really dead. I saw the video today. Mm. These people, oh, they think that they're dead. They think that they're really whatever, blah, blah, blah. And the cops are trying to pull them back, and they're, you know, he's all bloodied up, too, and everything else. And he's going, who put this makeup on me, man? Who do whatever? And he doesn't remember nothing of it. Isn't that awful? I mean, I used to work in prison, and I used to work with guys that were there because they didn't remember anything they had done either. 
sad, sad, so.